Gerald Edelman, uh, we're sitting here in your beautiful office in the amazing Neurosciences Institute in La Jolla, which is architecturally fantastic, and you described it to me a little earlier as a scientific monastery, and I'd like to come back and talk about that a little later. But um, I'd like to start closer to the beginning and um, refer to your childhood. In your biography, it's not mentioned that you actually wanted to be a violinist, a musician, when you were growing up. Yes. Can I ask you about that? Yes, you can. I uh, began studying the violin maybe at about age six or seven. My parents were quite interested in having all of my two sisters and myself musically at least informed. By the time I had reached uh, early adolescence, I'd fallen passionately in love with music. In fact, I remember exactly how that happened. It happened because my parents had a unique idea of babysitting, which is to get a box at Carnegie Hall and sit my eldest sister and myself in it for the duration of the concert while they went out to dinner and then come and fix, fix us, pick us up, etc. And I remember seeing Sir Fr uh, Sir Fritz Reiner, uh, a very great conductor, and I could actually see here a pimple on his nose or something, and they played Anna Klein and Nach music, and I fell in love. I just said, my goodness. My parents were quite disconcerted about this. They said, uh, look, we've got this beautiful Italian violin for you, but, you know, you don't really want to do that kind of thing. It's like juggling. And I said, mother, um, Mozart and Beethoven are not juggling. So I set out on my own. She said, I see that didn't work, so I have two more things to say to you. And I said, what, mother? She said, Yasha Heifetz. And she walked out of the room. So I did pursue a career, in fact, with one of Heifetz's classmates from the St. Petersburg Conservatory of Leopold Auer. And I actually started the idea of recitals and concert violin. And, and But then one day I discovered that I really uh, discovered, is not what perhaps the right word, but, but I wasn't really a performer. I wasn't interested in transforming the occasion. And there are two aspects of being a musician that's reproductive music. One is to play musically with great depth and originality. The other is to perform, to set up the occasion. And I remember I didn't do that, so I had a real crisis and said, well, I guess you know, I'll just quit performing and I'll do composition. Uh, it's only one little trouble. I knew the theory, but I didn't have the slightest talent whatsoever for composition. That lady over there that you see in that picture, that's my daughter. She's a composer. She doesn't know half as much theory, but she sings like a lark. <laughs> there it is. So that's when I decided I would go into science. It was, and science was the obvious alternative to music? Well, uh, it seemed to me uh, there was no direct connection. It, I had read, I'll tell you what happened. I had read in something called the Harvard Classics, a sort of five-foot shelf of classics. I had read uh, Faraday's lecture on a candle. The, from, the 90, from the 1860 Royal yes, Institution? Yes, 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 the Royal Institution. And I don't know, somehow that inspired me. And it's not the only thing. I was interested in gadgeteering and model airplanes and things of that kind. I, mentioned it in that thing I showed you from People's Archive that uh, I once tried to make a welding machine out of some tiles, some nichrome wire, Ohm's law, and etc., and a curling iron. And uh, when I plugged it in, I almost blew up the entire power panel of the house. My father was not pleased. But I was interested in gadgeteering, and I can't quite put my finger on why I got into science, but I did. My father was a medical practitioner, and I had the mis mistaken idea that to do science you had to be a doctor, a physician. It wasn't so, but that's how I got into medical school and did all the rest from there. Mm, mm, mm. And so you went, you went to a sinus college first and then went to Pennsylvania for medical school. Were, were you a good student? No. Uh, well, good. I, I really hated school, if that's what you mean. <laughs> uh, I, in fact, dropped out of a sinus. I didn't get into college. Uh, for all kinds of reasons having to do with the fact that uh, the principal of my high school, which is a public school, uh, wrote some dep deprecation in my uh, letters. That was because I said something about standing ar armies in a, in a dialogue, in a debate, and he completely misunderstood what I said. Uh, but my sister was a bridge uh, expert, and so was the dean of her sinus. I said, get me in because mother says I'm going to have to work if I don't go to school. I, in fact, dropped out of school, and uh, I was totally bored by lectures of the kind they were giving. 
I finally arranged through my mother again to get a deal gone where I could have a key to the library, didn't have to attend lectures, just took exams in laboratories, which they did at Osinus. Very nice. That's very free thinking of them. It was very free thinking. And what I learned is this, that the faculty did not use the library. <laughs> Other than that, it's fine. Then Penn, the University of Pennsylvania, was the first time I was exposed to what I might call a broad view and deep view of scholarly effort. So that was sort of inspiring. And from there, I went on to Harvard to Massachusetts General. Mm-hmm. And were you, so you chosen medicine because it seemed to be a sensible course. Were you, were you taken by medicine? Did it suddenly yes attract? and yes and no i i uh, it was the first time i could see a deep connection between knowledge and skill which is i think an interesting thing i mean if you do medicine besides the horizon it gives you on humanity you have to apply a certain kind of judgment and skill of course it is a scientific judgment in full because uh, your facts are always incomplete it's, i'd say it's a paramilitary art let's put it that way and I stayed on and did this internship, house officership uh, internship at Harvard simply because I said, well, you know, you've gone this far, go. But I still intended to do science. Mm, mm, mm-hmm. And then I uh, volunteered in the army, which was... Which took you to Paris. Which took me to Paris. And uh, <laughs> I remember that I had arranged to get a kind of job in research at Walter Reed Hospital in Washington. And when the orders got cut and it said Paris, I was deeply disappointed, but I assure you my wife was not. She was enchanted. In fact, what she called it at that time was the F. Scott Fitzsettlement period. Um, <laughs> at the Grand we, right. And we, we, <clears throat> it was pretty nice. We were assigned to the 196 Station Hospital, which is an Hôpital Américain. I spoke French because I had gone to a French school by scholarship during high school. And... Um, it was a remarkable time. It was a time when things were seemingly a little less complex than they are now in the political scene. And so in the army, they had this headquarters of European command, and I was one of the surgeons there, seeing a lot of patients and delivering babies. And during that time, I read a lot of science. So it was, it was quite fortunate in a way. The main thing is that there was a a library on the Champs-Élysées called uh, the American Library, and that was a book, that was the first set of books I read on protein chemistry. And I decided, in my naive way, I read a book about immunology, and I said, oh, I'm going to do the antibody molecule. Because the antibody molecule at that time was... was An egg. It was an egg. They had all this stuff about antigens, and the reason they did was because of Lonsteiner, Carl Lonsteiner, Nobel laureate from the Rockefeller, maybe one of the greatest, if not the greatest scientist after Avery at the Rockefeller. And he had shown that you could make antibodies to any organic compound that had enough structure. And that, uh, that was an extraordinary thing. So everybody paid a lot of attention to the antigen. Of course, I and my naivete didn't know the state of protein chemistry at the time. Sanger had just maybe begun to do his sequence of insulin. And so uh, I saw this egg-shaped thing that said, well, that can't be it. And why are they talking about that? It's the antibody that counts, so I'll go and do that. And so in that way, naivete paid off. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, indeed. You then returned to the newly formed Rockefeller University, which had grown out of the Rockefeller Institute. And as you... And this is your, this is 1957. This is your PhD thesis, right. and you did the work for which you were then awarded the Nobel Prize in '72 curious, with Rodney Porter. Yeah, yes. curious. Uh, how look, a lot of this is all ha- having to do with luck. I, I, I forget who told me the story of uh, Niels Bohr, and my friend again, uh, Isidore Rabi, who was a close friend, is and brought a lot of quantum mechanics to America in the European style at the right time. He was visiting Bohr at his country house, according to this story. And uh, Bohr was showing off, and he showed him this room. And above the door, there was a lucky horseshoe. And he said, Neil, certainly you don't believe in that stuff. And Bohr said, I'm told it works whether you believe in it or not. Okay. So there was this kind of luck factor. And there was this naivete factor where I said, uh, I was unimpeded by knowledge, right? I said, I'm going to do it now. Stein and Moore, the two people who won the chemistry prize at the same time that I did this physiology medicine prize, they had been doing ribonuclease. 
molecular weight of the order of 15,000, a little smaller. And when I said I was going to do a molecule of 150, they thought I was mad, and they were in a way right. But it turned out that a hidden variable showed up, namely that I showed that the molecule had chains, and one of the small chains was within reach. Once you got that, you could get the whole thing. So there you are, fortunate. Fortunate, um, but initially disbelieved. You, you, published, you published your initial results in a one-page Jack's paper oh, yes. in 59. Yeah, that's a story I'm not going to tell you in full, because science has this curious feature in which somehow its practitioners seem to borrow the notion of virtue, uh, because of course if you're not mad, you're not going to lie, you're going to be straightforward about your data, and you're not going to show prejudice. But in the bibliography and other places, there's much of that kind. So what happened, in fact, is that I was told by a number of people that I was mad, that my discovery was going to ruin my career if I published it. And finally, I, out of desperation and 169 experiments later, I said, I'm going to do it anyhow, and I'm going to do it in a journal where they don't have any sort of influence. So I did. I sent it as a letter to the Journal of the American Chemical Society. Now, if you'd like, I'll leap forward in time to 1972 in Stockholm, a place in which the largest uh, export of Sweden occurs, called the Nobel Prize. And I was sitting on the stage, and I, by the way, I had been ill. I had a little gastroenteritis. I hadn't taken my medical kit with me. My sister, however, had tincture of opium. I knew this much about folk medicine, that that could sort of calm your gut. But I took four times the recommended dose, and I was spooked, I was sitting there like this saying to myself, my God, these Swedes have some high fi set. It happened to be the Swedish Philharmonic behind me, but I couldn't turn. People said my eyes were so marvelously fixed for television. I was in complete trance. When I opened the, uh, what, what do you call it, the description of the prize, which you only do right at that time, mm -hmm. they referred to that paper. But at the time, Rod Porter, who won the prize with me, had published a paper, and this is why I think people were disconcerted. He published a paper in which he was a single long chain, and he was a doyen, you know, he was a student of Sanger, and he had real scope. I was no, uh, nobody, in a sense. And so I was told, you know, you contradict him, and bow wow. Well, I did anyhow, and it turned out to be right. There we are. I mean, Interesting that there was no doubt in your mind. You, 169 experiments, you mentioned. Well, that was doubt. 169 <laughs> was one, one episode after another of doubt. <laughs> sure, science is skepticism. But skepticism followed by some kind of conviction that, look, knowledge must be dispersed and you'll take the risk. I mean, the fact is, if you do all the things you can do, mm. then, of course, you'll just wait and see how it comes out, mm. which is what happened. Since you're mentioning what science is, I'd like to repeat that quote from your banquet speech. You say, science is imagination in the service of the verifiable truth. Yes, with a big emphasis on imagination. By the way, I just received a, an honorary degree from the Rockefeller uh, a couple of months ago. I, I'm not good at chronology, not, not very long ago. And they wanted me to speak three times. First at the convocation, where I got the honorary degree. Second at a dinner, where I was supposed to be lighthearted. And third, to give a lecture on what I'm working on now, which is the brain. And I remember in the, uh, in the lecture during the convocation, which was no more than about eight minutes, seven, eight minutes, I brought up this very subject, science imagination and the service of the verifiable truth. And uh, I recounted the boss that I had, Detlef Branck, who began the university, I had been appointed a dean, no less, and therefore I had to work for him. And I pointed out that he was a curious combination, a very important combination, a kind of political genius in a way, a combination of uh, romantic idealism and political cunning. And he, th those three things worked beautifully because he picked all the students in the beginning. And I pointed out that uh, the example I wanted to use is Coleridge, who in Biographia Literaria uh, talked about imagination versus fancy. And there was a really marvelous, marvelous book by John Livingston Lowe's, 
about the poem on Xanadu, in Xanadu de Kublai Khan, a stately pleasure dome decree where out the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. And if a student knew about John Lehman's and Lowe's, he was accepted on the spot. And that's how Bronk picked the first two classes, and they were the best classes that were ever picked. <laughs> Don't ask me how he did it, but it, the idea was this. He was for imagination. Now the problem is, of course, clear. Imagination unrestrained, or even imagination like poetic imagination, will not do in science. But you begin pretty much that way, don't you? You begin a sort of associative ambiguity, and then you clean it up with math and physics and whatever else you have at your disposal. But you don't clean up everything, do you? Mm. Mm. Especially what's up in here. So that was an interesting thing, and I, I, I believe that. I believe one of the great problems of modern science in certain aspects is success of a certain kind breeds failure because everybody becomes enormously specialized and expert and they don't look on either side and you don't get this kind of cross-fertilization and association that really gives rise to very remarkable science. Mm -hmm. That seems a good point at which to jump way forward and talk about this institute because your Neurosciences Institute is founded around that principle of interdisciplinary interchange. Yes, in a, in a sense, although I must say it wasn't explicit. I mean, there was nothing corny about it or explicit in which I said, this is the way it's going to be. In fact, what I did simply is reenact what I had experienced at the early Rockefeller and said, look, the main thing is young people should be allowed to be a little crazy. Don't, don't fix them in a career path so tight that they have to get an NIH grant and become a little lawyer to write the grant proposal and become cynical about it competition and all of that, and uh, try to pick people who are not picked because of their specialty, but because of their imagination. Now, of course, that's a risky enterprise, isn't it? You can't really get 100% there, can you? Uh, if I were as good as Bronk, I'd be very grateful. But I think I've hit about 50% in picking people of a certain kind. Indeed, one of them just signed in today from the East Coast, Ruggiero Scozioni. Um, so you're giving people space to take risks here? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yes. How do, you, what do you, how do you pick the people who you think are going to take the best risks? Very hard to answer that question, isn't it? I mean, it's a, an intuitive situation. You, you read the grain of their thought. You, you talk about things. I don't try Xanadu. I don't try Coleridge. I don't go way out with Shakespeare. But what I try to do is sort of figure... Well, let, let me tell you the story of how I got into the Massachusetts General Hospital, which is sort of the grand pinnacle, in a way, of American medicine at its time. Superb tradition, etc. I went up with the, the chap who in my medical class was one set of marks ahead of me. I was a second in the class, I think, and I, but I didn't work the way this chap did. We went up there, and here's what they do. They take you in a room with four people, and they start asking you questions. If at the end of it, I didn't realize this, at the end of it a girl comes and you're either escorted out the door, thank you, goodbye, or upstairs with the whole faculty there, 20 people, and they really grill you. Well, that's happened to me. In the course of the first four, though, uh, one of the chaps asked me, the head of the cancer division there, asked me, how does a cyclotron work? And I was startled. I mean, totally startled. I said, well, I'm not a physicist, but I think there are these Ds and there's this magnetic field and the thing is going on. I gave the answer. And when I got on the train back with this chap from my class, mm -hmm. I said, well, there's one thing for sure. I'm not going to get in here. Uh, I said, I couldn't answer more than 30% of their questions. And some guy asked me about a cyclotron, for God's sake. You know? He said, oh, I answered all of them. He said, but there was one they really was pretty stupid. They asked me about an electrocardiogram in the whale. And I said, that's, that's really stupid. And I said to myself, Warren, you lose. Paul Dudley White, the great cardiologist, was seen in the New England Journal harpooning a whale. Okay. <laughs> I got in. He didn't. He answered the questions. When I met this chap, Baker, who asked me the question about the cyclotron later on, I said, Bill, why did you ask me that question? He said, I ran out of questions. <laughs> I, and then I realized they wanted to see the style of your answer. And I suppose the answer to your question, long-winded though it is, is if I look for the style of the answer, 
And sometimes you're right and sometimes you're not. But uh, you have to be lenient, I think, and risky. And so, to some extent, it's been justified. There have been some nice discoveries here. Turning to the sort of questions people ask, and back to your own, um, your own research career, you worked on antibody structure for a, a while, yes. but when you sort of made some in the initial progress, you decided to move towards development rather than stay with antibodies. I see that you have actually taken the trouble to look at my minuscule achievements somewhere along the line, at least in a chronological sense. What happened is that, well, again, it's so easy to categorize and to be wrong, but I think there are different kinds of scientists. And there are kinds, well, let me see, uh, Max Perutz would come to mind. Max Perutz never stopped on hemoglobin to his dying day. It was just endless fixation. Now, I, uh, when I had finished with my colleagues, and of course, that's another issue, you, you, science is, is we, art is I, right? And so when we finished that, I felt that I had gotten an answer that I was seeking. I had scratched my itch. I was interested in the problem of uh, how antibodies who recognize molecules for example, that never even existed before in the history of the Earth and that couldn't be accounted for by evolutionary selection. Once I saw the business about how the antibody molecule had areas of hypervariability, the binding sites that were caused by somatic variation, a really unique and interesting idea, and also that the other part of the molecule was responsible for its functions, I said, well, of course, that's the question I wanted answered, and I belong to class two scientists. Class one scientists, maybe Perutz, stick to it all the way. And I said, uh, class two are kind of a little romantic, go to the dark places. So I asked myself that question, you know, where, where's a place that's sort of the same kind of question, and one of them, which still hasn't been fully answered, was developmental biology. The problem of morphogenesis, how does a three, one-dimensional genetic code specify a three- or four-dimensional animal. And you can do all the genetics you want, but you have yet still to explain how you actually get the mechanochemistry coupled to the genetics. In fact, I wrote a book about it once. Um, so I got there, and uh, at that point, working with my colleagues again, we discovered these cell adhesion molecules. And curiously enough, speak about serendipity, uh, it turns out that they had structures very similar to antibodies really, in my end, was my beginning, is the way I put it. From there, it wasn't much of a jump to say, well, look, you were interested in recognition problems, how in the immune recognition and how about in recognizing cell-cell interactions. Uh, I was working on retiny, chick retiny, uh, which was the basic substrate for getting, isolating the cell adhesion molecule, the NCAM, neural cell adhesion molecule. And uh, then it became a little more abstract, namely, how does your brain recognize anything? And so that is a coarse explan explanation. But of course, probably under psychiatric care, I would give another explanation. <laughs> it's the one that I think is reasonably, ostensibly the one that I sort of use on myself. So it, it's, it's following, it's following this, this idea of recognition, recognition of antibodies. Yes. It seemed to me that that's a really fundamental issue. Even go, of course, it all starts with Darwin, right? And that's the fundamental issue. How, in a, how can a particular set of variants of a species confront an unknown environment or an echo niche and somehow find fitness, find a match of some degree? That idea, the Darwin two steps, variation and selection, has in fact infused everything I've ever done. Uh, there, there are, of course, disagreements about this. People think that to have a Darwinian model, you must have cell replication or some kind of uh, replication, uh, reproduction, things of that kind. <clears throat> Natural selection is differential reproduction, but the idea can be generalized to three things. Generator of diversity, G-O-D, 
polling, some way of confronting two physical entities in which the second entity to be recognized is not needed to get the first entity as a repertoire. And the third is, when they do confront, to take those variants that match best or better and amplify them. So those three principles uh, infuse everything I've ever done, although the mechanisms in each case, immunity, development, evolution, they're all different, and brain Brain, brain action, they're all different. The mechanisms differ, but the principles are the same, I think. I think it's, it's easier to follow that through the antibody work and the developmental biology yes. than it is when you get onto higher brain function. For a darn good reason. That's pretty complicated, yeah. yeah. And there's also deep prejudice, I must add. That is to say, we, we inherit a vast body of, uh, how shall I say, elaborations from psychology, from Aristotle on maybe, or oh, maybe the 6th century BC, Greek scholars, uh, Greek philosophers, from that all the way on through philosophy itself, there's been a huge burden, I would say, of speculation. And only recently, well, let's say at the late part of the 19th century is when modern neuroscience began and could shed some light in a way that had happened in, say, immunology and other places. But of course, it's very much more complicated. You published um, this book, Neural Darwinism, I think in 1987, which began to lay the foundations of this idea of applying the ideas you've been talking about, the Darwinian ideas you've been talking about, to, to, the, to brain study. Yeah. And that, that, was, that was sort of ahead of its time. It was, it was people reacted to it in different strongly. ways. Strongly. Yes. Strongly, yes, yes indeed. There's one little axiom you can take away from that. If you want controversy, theorize in biology. You're looking for it. But um, in fact, so the point is whatever stirs the pot. Let me say what I did learn from uh, the developmental work, and also to some extent inherited from immunology, and that is the individuality and diversity of the nervous system is the most striking aspect that in the following sense, that I can make a statement almost sure that I'm correct, given the complexity of the nervous system. No two nervous systems of higher organisms or higher nervous systems are identical. None, even in twins. That immediately says something interesting because that's what Darwin noticed. And in fact, Darwin's great idea began from population thinking, which is the idea that instead of from the top down like a philosopher, uh, classification can occur in the following way, from the bottom up by selection against a very diverse population, with no need for that which is to be recognized to be involved in the actual process of making the repertoire. That was an amazing idea, and it occurred to me when I published that book and that's why I called it neural Darwinism, that this population thinking is the way you can explain how the brain works. For example, if you take the opposite point of view, the instructional point of view or the instructive theory, that it's a sort of like a computer where you have, well then, then the world must be much simpler, at least in your mind, than it really is. This world is unbelievably complex, right? Let me try to make that clear. The brain does not work in a vat, alone. The brain is embodied, it's in your body, and your body and brain interact with the environment. Now, people say to me when I do some of my theoretical modeling on brain-based devices, well, you're using the brain as a computer simulation, and that is a Turing machine, so how can you say that? I say, yes, the only thing is this. The Turing machine, with this brilliant mathematician, British mathematician Turing, said, if I have an endless tape written in binary arithmetic and I have a tape head and I can read, write, erase, move one to the right, one to the left, mm -hmm. I can show you that I can construct a universal Turing machine under a program which will account for every kind of machine of that kind as long as the procedures are unambiguous. But there's only one trouble. The world is not unambiguous. The number of ways you can partition this room is probably infinite. And therefore, which one are you going to pick? Well, then the whole thing is not a Turing machine. So that kind of thinking infused a lot of my thought and my work in neural modeling. Mm. And of course, it wasn't just speculation. 
in the following sense. It was a kind of modeling test, as in complex systems of this kind, you can't write in a single equation. So I used computers a lot to make these devices, and it occurred to me in the making of these models that I couldn't just make a model ab initio from my own brain, because that would be, in a way, cheating on this issue of the environment. So make something like a robot, but not a robot, because you have a simulated brain, and it's interacting in the world. And then you've solved this problem of, well, how do you model the world? Well, the answer is by being in it. So my observations have been, first of all, that neuroscience has tended to grow enormously, but be rewarded in a very narrow way for each specialty. And the feeling of the specialists is that's the only way you can get ahead. You don't dare to move over several of them. Uh, The second thing is, I think, you might say in the bourgeois countries of this world, the ones that have more fortune, most people who are educated equate science with technology. That's not correct. Science is about understanding. Technology is a byproduct, but it's perfectly understandable why they take that position. It fixes your health. It gives you fancy fighter planes. It makes your cars go smoother, etc., etc., etc. But in fact, uh, that's unfortunate because, of course, there has been enormous achievement of technological progress by science. But people don't and shouldn't, I suppose, be informed in detail about how that begins in the very weird bottom level of trying to understand. Look, the House of Science has many rooms and motivations notwithstanding, all kinds of disparate things can happen. And so no single set of beliefs is a guarantor of, of, of any insight whatsoever. I still come back to a certain amount of mystical luck being in the right place, having the right colleagues, all of that. And, of course, the Institute, you brought it up, is founded on this notion of the scientific monastery, sort of a place where young people at a certain stage of their life can carry on that way. Um, There is an element of age and stage. I mean, it does help to have a few older people who have seen a little more broadly but not as people who assign them to do this and this and this as experts and technologists, but rather to say, well, let me check your ideas out and we'll argue about them, but go ahead. And so that's the way the Institute sort of works. Mm-hmm. And you've emphasized the, the, the importance of crossing the boundaries between the di- different disciplines of neuroscience. How, how, how does one actually achieve that here? Because I don't know. <laughs> I mean, how does one achieve it? Well, amongst the people here, or how does one individually? Amongst the people here. Well, I believe the first thing is, there's an interesting parameter, size. Okay, what we've learned is the following. If you want to get ahead very quickly with, within some particular query or question or issue, have visiting fellows meet eight or less in a room without slots. Okay, so the definition of a conference at the Neuroscience Institute is anything equal or less to eight SOBs in a room without slides. And the reason is that once you get up to the size of a meeting, all kinds of proprietary, selfish, political things enter, specialties, all of that, all of those badges and whatever. But people behave very well in small groups. And so we've shown this over a thousand people over the years of the existence of the Institute. It works beautifully. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the same principle can apply here. For example, I meet with uh, about three groups every week, not to go over all the little lab details, so that's, that's something for inside the lab, but to sort of revisit some questions. So one, one way is that, and another way is to have lunch. That, uh, four days a week we have lunch. One day of those four is spent at a journal club. There's a funny degradation of the cuisine at that time. It's sort of just sandwiches, nothing fancy. The rest of the time they're spoiled. And Friday is off because it's California and Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you know. And again, the, the idea is not you're supposed to work, you're supposed to push out, there's supposed to this grant, none of that. The rest is affinity, simply allowing people to sort of match each other and not even talk about the business-like arrangement of a collaboration. Just like a family, just 
pick the guys. And uh, a lot of that goes on I don't even know about. I, I learn about it ex post facto, I mean. Now, is this the only way? No, of course not. The, how do I put it? The NIH spends over $28 billion a year on this other model. And as a model of putting forth translational research, so-called applied, technologically oriented, or specialized research, okay, fine, only about half of it is wasted. But uh, the idea of what happened in the 20th century in these smaller places like Cambridge, Rockefeller, and Caltech in their original form, that idea is gone, I think, pretty much. Now, whether it'll resurrect or not, I don't know. The main point about it is, you might say, from a critical point of view, you say this is very impractical. On the other hand, by the way, financially, aside from the horror of having to raise the money for it every year, it's rather less expensive than the other way. Where does the money come from? It comes from private sources and from those aspects of uh, from research foundations, private and public, and from those aspects of government where the, the grant is given to us and not to an individual. I mean, I go occasionally now, only occasionally, to give a lecture at some university, and I might have a chairman of a department say, that's my best man, he has two R01 grants. The idea that somehow somebody's the best man because he has several grants is, to me, repugnant. Now, sometimes it probably corresponds to insight, but given the way the system works, I doubt it. It requires traits that are not scientific. Say it that way. Mm -hmm. Are you trying to export this model, or do you see any hope that it will be exported? Well, the problem, of course, is money, isn't it? I mean, um, several people have said, this is a terrific idea, we should have five more of them dotted around the country, each different in different areas, even in, so in the soft sciences, even in sociology and, in, and things of that kind. Uh, and it's not a think tank. That isn't the way. It, ha it has, in fact, shared properties with what happens uh, over at my place in my lab in the conventional sense. Over its, over its scripts, yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's not a think tank. It's just it's sort of this model that says, look, uh, let people be and let them select out on their own and let them be free of these immediate pressures of efficiency and throughput and publish or perish. But I think of... I mean, my own publication record, I've been in science for 50 years now, something like that. I have something like 555 papers, publications, mostly with others, but sometimes not. And I suspect that about seven of them are good. Um, one of them or two of them are really not bad, better than good. But imagine, I mean, is it just a crank? Um, and the issue is there are factors of this kind working in science today that are unfortunate. For example, there's the belief amongst the kids over across the street that the place you want to publish is science, nature, and cell. And indeed, that strikes me as just damn foolish because this paper, which had seven reprint requests in all of its history, the one we referred to about the dissociation of gamma globulin, that had seven reprint requests it was utterly unknown, but of course, somewhere, somehow, somebody saw what it's about. And the idea that some, somehow science, because it's rational in its pursuits or attempted to be, is not subject, like all other things, to fluctuations is really a foolish way of looking at it. So I think, and this probably is wrong, provably wrong in terms of reward, I think the idea that the only place you should publish are those three journals or something like it is really quite, quite wrong. Do you worry for the future of the Institute after you stop being associated with it? Do you think it's dependent on your presence? Oh, and well, your that, of course, is one of the problems of, that immediately arises. We do have a board and we do have a succession plan. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, by that time, I won't be in a position where the signal and noise ratio is anything but zero, so I'm not going to worry about it. But yes, but the fact is that the Institute is run day to day by Ina Gall, who is, uh, who's head of the, what do, what do they call him, research director. I'm the director, okay? I symbolize all day, let's put it that way. Um, 
and of course, it's, one is subject to that kind of thing. It says, well, it'll collapse when? Well, what's really much more to the point is how do we get it funded in a way that guarantees an ongoing future? So I'm not worried. I mean, the feeling is, okay, if the Institute has to close, well, all right. It was good for what it was. If it can change into something else, so much the better. One thing I know for sure, there's one rule that should not be broken, keep it small. Keep it small. As a last thought, do you have any intention of putting down this collective, the, the, the view of science you've collected over, the, over your career into some, into, into some book form? Good grief, no. It's bad enough to be lambasted for trying to do a theory of brain function. We haven't talked about consciousness, by the way. I don't know how to express my gratitude, but... Uh, would you like to talk? Well, yeah, I, uh, I would. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you think a dog is conscious? Yes. Okay. I can't prove it, and you can't, in a direct way, in the way I can with you. I could doubt that you're conscious, but if I put you into certain experimental modes, I think I can make a damn good case. And the reason is that you have language and can report. A dog, according to my theory, extended neural Darwinism, a dog has primary consciousness. That dog can, as a result of a transaction between the posterior parts of its brain and the anterior parts, can create scenes in what I call the remembered present, what William James, the great psychologist, called the specious present. Maybe three, five seconds, ten seconds, something of that kind. The rest is darkness, like a light in a room. And the dog can have long-term memory, but he doesn't have high order consciousness. If you kick a dog, the next time he sees you, he could bite you or run away. But he doesn't sit around in the meantime plotting to remove your tenure. And the reason he doesn't is he doesn't have high order consciousness, which comes as a later evolutionary development and in the invention of language. Now, once you invent language, I believe, and this is what's changed my mind, all bets are off. One of my sons happens to be a physical anthropologist, and he knows a hell of a lot more than I do about this kind of thing, but I believe we invented language. I don't think it evolved. It evolves on its own, but I don't think it's as a result directly that it was selected for that way. But once you invented language, Alice in Wonderland, Sigmund Freud, schizophrenia, mad plans of Iago, Tandu, Othello, Shakespeare, etc., etc., and then some scientific idea that maybe the brain is a selectional device. And all of a sudden, you realize that the power of language rests partly in its clarity, but mostly in its ambiguity. Because the way our brains work, you can't associate things the way a computer does by looking up a list. You have to associate through ambiguity. It's a degenerate situation in which things having completely different structures can give you the same output. So I couldn't have Coleridge in poetry, could I, unless I had ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, you, if you look at it that way. Now, what did we do in science? Well, we start there, not necessarily just with language. Einstein did it with imagery and whatever. And then you clean it up. You use math and you use logic and then you use verification where you can and build this structure. Does it exhaust everything? No. I once heard an apocryphal story, I don't think this is true, that Einstein was once asked, is science exhaustive? And presumably the old man looked out the window, smiled and said, probably, but what's the use? It's like describing a Beethoven symphony in terms of air pressure waves. Okay, so some curious thing distinguishes us, right? For biologically, we have true language. No other species does. Once we have, all bets are off. And the reason is that, of course, I believe that it's the jittering of my neurons that are responsible for the jabbering I'm giving you now. But the many, many relationships are astronomical. Your cortex alone has 30 billion neurons and a million billion connections. If you counted one per second, you just finished counting them 32 million years later. And the number of possible graphs is far beyond anything astronomers think about. So the idea that somehow... I could put an electro, a billion electrodes in your brain and say you're thinking of Vienna by looking at the, the graph. is absurd. If it's not in principle absurd, it's in practice absurd because of the many, many relations. And the curious irony of it is that science itself owes much to this ambiguity, which is part of what we call imagination. 
So it's a curious loop, isn't it? And I think the study of consciousness forces you to confront this issue of asking, well, what is it? And what does it govern? And how would you show it? Now, it turns out <clears throat> that even in the human case, it's very hard to show. But I'll give you one experiment we've done that says something related to the theory. And that is the following. There's a, there's a, uh, how should I say, a model called binocular rivalry. I don't know if you've heard of it. You present blue and red. You present blue and red, and you present v red vertical, blue horizontal. Your brain cannot, as it ordinarily does with stereoscopic vision, fuse those. So what it does is suppresses one and opens the other, suppresses the other and opens the one, back and forth. If you do that um, in a room where you're recording the magnetic currents of the brain in magnetoencephalography, if you do that and at the same time you use a frequency tag, something which oscillates the intensity so you can use that frequency to do your math with, and link the signal to the response. What we found is that when a person becomes conscious of, say, the red vertical or the blue horizontal, there's an explosion of reentry. That is to say, the phase difference between distant parts of your brain goes to zero. They all fire at the same time. We should perhaps just dwell on this on this this term reentry because okay, yes. you, it's, it's hard to understand. It's hard to understand. It's, it's hard to understand yeah. Yes. Okay. So the theory says the following that the brain is a selectional system, that during development, every individual develops differently because neurons that fire together wire together, and the, the exposure is different in the world. So there's, pro there's, there's, pro there's developmental selection, and then during experience, even after the synapses are made, they change in strength, so they're like traffic cops at each synapse, saying yes, no, yes, no. And the numbers go up ama amazingly, and in fact, that synaptic changes. But neither of those, the developmental selection or the experiential selection, explains spatiotemporal correlation. How do you get things together? Here's where reentry comes in. Well, here's the way to think of it. Let's do it this way. Supposing I talk about the corpus callosum in your brain, which has, say, 200 million fibers of axons going back and forth linking the two cortices. Every 10 milliseconds, one of those is firing. Imagine that. Trrr. Women, by the way, have more. The sexual dimorphism it's possibly explains a lot of things, including American elections, but we won't get into that. So the issue is, uh, what does that mean? Is it like feedback? No. Feedback occurs when you have an error signal that goes back on one path. But here you have millions of paths. What happens is that couples things in such a way that the temporal oscillation and temporal phase relationships going to zero means they act as an effective circuit, back, forth, back, forth. People have a hard time understanding this, and the way I put it is something like this. Supposing I had a mad quartet, two violins, a viola, and a cello, each one playing his own tunes and rhythm. Well, that sounds awful. That's a cacophony. But supposing I hook them up by jillions of fibers so that when they play, they start to couple and pretty soon they're, they're swaying this way. Well, things will converge and they will get certain sensible things out of it. That's re-entry. Right? Now, that's, of course, a silly and primitive example. But we've actually shown in computers that it works. right? And we show in this experiment it works. So, uh, essentially, consciousness depends critically on re-entry because once you've given up the idea of logic and a clock, like a computer, something has to link the thing together. And that's the key and most difficult idea. Now, I think that's what happened during evolution, maybe 250 million years ago. New circuits were built that were reentrant that gave the opportunity to create a scene. Once, however, you go to the next level, which is maybe 100,000 years ago, and you invent a language or a language, at that point, the whole thing changes and Shakespeare takes over. I mean, Harold Bloom of Yale once told me that he didn't think Freud was a very great psychologist, but he really a great literary figure. He had only one problem. He was envious of Shakespeare for being there first. All right. So once you get into that, you see that you have to put science in a frame that does not exhaust all explanations. No way. Now, there'll be people who disagree with that, I'm sure. That's why I'm going to answer your question in the negative. No, I'm not going to write this down. <laughs> Something like that. Do you think that there are others who have made the same, the same transition between a view of science as being 
completable in a view of science that is of science yeah, that is. I've spoken to people uh, about this, and there are some who look at me and say, "Well, I, I don't know what you're making such a fuss about. I believe that ever since I was an adolescent." There are some. The problem is if you go too far the other way against scientism, which is too excessive a point of view. If you go the other way, you get into a very blurry, bad thing in which you want to teach intelligent design in the in the high schools. And so there's this terrific, there's still going to be a tension, isn't there? And it's interesting to me from, from the standpoint of scientific sociology or history or whatever, that in, as I said, bourgeois societies where you have a reasonable comfort in democracy, most people identify science with technology. That's good in one way, but it's bad in another because from an educational point of view, if the imagination part is in, you don't want to make it too efficient, do you? It brings us back to the Institute. You don't want to do that because the minute you do that, you get a bunch of experts. Do you think that people are asking, in general, the right questions these days? Well, let's pick, a, let's pick an example to make it concrete. Uh, there's one aspect of neuroscience where the questions have been asked, but they're not right. That isn't a criticism of the guys, but it's a, uh, an indication of the difficulty. And that's motor control. How can I do this? Uh, how does that relate to will? Okay, and then I get into dangerous territory, don't I? Call free will, etc. Um, I was once asked recently, where, where was it? Oh yeah, I was at the Rockefeller during that degree ceremony. Afterwards, when I gave my lecture about consciousness, someone got up and started to talk about free will. He said, you haven't explained the problem of free will. I said, neither has anyone else. And he finally pushed very hard. And I said, OK, let me say what my answer to you is. You are determined to have it in both senses of the word. OK, I don't believe you have it in a posterior sense after you've done something. But in the anterior sense, you're determined to treat me and you. And how else would you treat me? If you had free will, please answer that. So you do treat, we do treat each other as if we did, because we have myriad choices. That doesn't mean necessarily that they aren't caused or they go against the scientific dogma. So I think uh, there are people who believe that, but there's a, then, then you've opened it up to a spectrum of beliefs. Some people think science is bad, Luddites. Uh, other people think science is everything. Can we go back to the, the question of questions and, and the, the control of the... Of, 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 of motor, motor control, motor control. yeah. Well, yeah, so here's what the problem is. The problem is... <clears throat> that it's clear that when I reach for something, I'm not doing something I do when I have a robot arm. I'm not using physical equations because the complexity of the movements. Let, let's take a baby. All right, let's start with the baby. At about five months, babies can start to reach for things. I don't know if you know this, but girl babies and boy babies reach differently. Yeah. Boy babies flap with all four, and then they close it down. Girl babies are much more cautious and speed up toward the end. It may have something to do with later decisions having to do with the daughters of presidential candidates. I'm not sure, but whatever. The fact is, if you look at that, that's a well-known problem known as Bernstein's problem after the great Russian uh, motor physiologist, Bernstein. And the problem is that there, it isn't a question of reaching and solving an equation for acceleration and compliance and all that through all the joints. Because there are seven degrees of freedom between your shoulder and the end of your finger. And it takes six to solve the equation. So you're not doing it with simultaneous equations. That's out of the question. So how are you doing it? Well, I happen to believe that the way you're doing it is by constraint and selection. That you gradually shape down the amount of energy you spend. But then that leaves a problem. What controls that? Mm -hmm. Right? And it's not going to be like some set of equations in which a machine is being controlled or a BMW engine is going up and down. It's something we can't write yet completely. All right? And so that gets into very deep territory. For example, there's a part of your brain called the basal ganglia. That's the part that goes sour when you lose dopamine in the substantia nigra and you have Parkinson's disease. All right? Yes. Sorry. So once you have that, then you have all kinds of problems of tremor and coordination and what have you. You even have uh, 
a certain amount of cognitive disability. All right? So now the question is, how the devil does that work with your cortex? We know the cortex has a motor cortex, which infuses signals into your spinal cord. But how does it all control in terms of intending to do something? Mm. We don't really know the answer to that. Mm. We're trying hard upstairs, but we haven't succeeded yet. So what does this mean for the asking of questions, though? That people are, people are breaking it down into too many specific components? Or they become enamored of a physical explanation, pure and simple, namely that they're going to do it, and this has been the history of the field, they're going to do it the way a physicist would analyze emotion. Mm. Right? Mm. Mm. And now you run into certain uh, difficulties. There are people who are making progress, don't get the wrong idea. For example, uh, Apos Georgopoulos in Minneapolis is a man who showed that motor cortex is a question of a vector resolution of certain particular cells that have an orientation. They sum up and that has something to do with it. But that's not the whole answer. The whole answer has to account for willing. It has to account also for how perception is sensory motor. Now that's in neural Darwinism. Someday, post-mortem, they'll see that I had something when I said that. There's something called a global mapping. Perception is not just a registration like that camera, nothing of the sort. Perception is a sensory motor act in which the motor part does not necessarily result in action. Right? So you just nodded your head. But if I wanted to turn my head, it's in there curious. When I turn my head, the room stands still. But if I go like that, it doesn't. Right? So there are all these unbelievably complex interactions between sense and, and, and action. And uh, my personal belief, for example, is that thoughts are essentially motoric components of the neural Darwinism domain. Thoughts are motor without action. And the only question is, so what? You've said that, but you really don't understand it. Mm. Uh, so there's a wonderful problem. I mean, if we understand that, we've got a big, big advance. Again, it's the complexity and breaking it down into, 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 its, into its parts. Simplest, if you can. It, and it seems to be very difficult to ask the right questions when you're dealing with something that can only partially be seen, conceived. Is it just trial? Is it, is it okay, essentially your, trial and error? Uh, yes. You, uh, well, you put your finger on what I think is the central scientific problem of the 21st century, which is complexity. How far can science take you in complex systems? A beautiful example of which is the brain. Uh, an example which I think is a waste of time is uh, historical interaction amongst the post-Cold War large agencies with atomic bombs. That, that's a waste of time, but I think, and it's complex enough. But this complexity has a certain, as, as, as extensive as the numbers are, has a certain set of regularities, which is, after all, what you're after as a scientist, okay, without exhausting all of the system. Say it another way. Physics is really a magnificent achievement, isn't it? But it doesn't usually waste its time on thinking about what happens to the soap suds from your shaving as they go down the drain here, except in Australia. They'll, they'll use the example, but they won't bother. They'll have fluid dynamics, and that's good enough. But in the brain and in these other systems, the difficulty is you do have to pay attention to how the contribution the complexity is, right? So here's another way of looking at it, neural Darwinism. If the world is as complicated as I say it is, and when I'm looking past you into those trees and into the camera and whatever, um, then if it's a selectional system, there has to be a repertoire that's even much richer than that, right? But I don't have to know every detail. I have to know the rules of the repertoire the same way that I have to know for immunity. I have to know how antibodies are made variable. I don't have to know every antibody in my system, do I? Just need to know the rule. Yeah. And so here's why, for example, I'm against representationalism for brain science. I don't think you have representations in there. I don't think you have images like writing a picture. And any more than I believe that an antibody against the virus is a representation of the virus. I have a system which is reacting, a la, and the same thing holds for Darwinism and Darwinian ecology. So, uh, yeah, the problem is how do you deal with complex systems, and what is a complex system, and can you formalize it to a certain extent? And I believe, yes, you can to some degree. Mm. You can do that. Uh, a crystal is not a complex system because... Once a perfect crystal, once you know the unit cell and the space group, 
You just go on like that, no problem. Uh, gas is, uh, an ideal gas is not a complex system because it's random. There's no generic rule. Complexity is in between, it's sort of somewhere between a crystal and a gas. All right, now there are different forms. Complexity is complex. So, all right, coming, coming to the problem of the brain and making this very specific and trying to answer you, if I, I'm absolutely convinced that the motor control problem is a problem of complexity. If you look at the number of fibers going up and down between the basal ganglion and the cortex through the thalamus, wow, wow, wow. We don't know the rule. There will be certain rules. There's no doubt about that. And we won't, in any particular case, be able to say which one's fired when completely. But we'll get the general idea. That would be a great advance. Another one will be in consciousness. Can you conceive of a conscious creature? Let's make one up. Uh, supposing the world were just a plane of red. That's all. A 2D plane of red. Do you think you could have a creature that could have only that and be conscious? When you think about consciousness, it is because of this interaction of complex systems putting it all together. You can't be conscious just of my finger. You're hearing a buzz, you're feeling the seat, you're hearing my voice, etc. And it's all of a scene, right? But it changes. So, but the argument is the external complexity is therefore building internal Good. consciousness. Wonderful. Okay, you've, you've got it. Uh, therefore, I'm not completely incoherent. <laughs> it's a neat test. So it's like that. Consciousness is complex because what goes in is complex and it has to be more complex here. And then out of that type of complexity, I have to select a match the way the virus is recognized by the antibody. So I don't need to exhaust. So exhaustion is not the issue. Principle is the issue. And I think that's a good way of saying that that's the most generically challenging problem of global science, of physics and biology. Mm -hmm. My personal belief is there will come a day, this is a primitive we have upstairs, we don't have Turing up there, although I'll admit him if you find him. If we can do what we did with perception and brain-based devices, which we haven't talked about, if we could do that, then we could make a perception Turing machine. We could have a perception device which would speak to a Turing machine, which couldn't have perception because perception involves non-computable situations. Then you get a new kind of machine. That would be pretty exciting. And I think Turing actually began to think about that. He talked about something called an oracle Turing machine. So there are practical and technological possible advantages to this kind of brain science. And no, you don't have to exhaust everything to understand complexity, but we don't really understand it uh, well enough, I think. Do you want to speak a little bit about the, the brain-based devices? These, percent? Yeah, I mean, the idea behind a brain-based device is the following. We, we, when we were doing modeling at the Rockefeller, at the Neuroscience Institute, we didn't have an experimental side. We did computer modeling and we, we, we made a device called Darwin 3. Darwin 3 was a sessile device, it looked like a smart barnacle. It was sitting there and it had an arm, four jointed arm, motor control, and it had a head that went like that with one eye. And you threw, the, using a random number generator, you threw scaled objects at it and it would grab them and caress them. And if it felt that something was bumpy and it saw that it was stripy, it would push it away. So I could show you Darwin 3. I could, in fact, over there, although the picture is lousy. Um, and it, le it learned to do this. Yeah, it wasn't and you would see exactly this. I would show you only it and say, oh, by golly, I noticed it started flailing, but now it's doing it rather well, you know. Now I turn on its nervous system at the same time and say, holy moly, this thing is flat. And that's a simple-minded device. It had 50,000 neurons or something. All of a sudden, one day, we realized we were cheating. Why were we cheating? We weren't intending to cheat. But what happened is we were giving the objects edges and shapes. But that isn't the way it works. Your brain gives things edges and shapes. Edges and shapes do not exist out there as a, yes, they're, they're correlated with the stability of energy differences. This chair has an energetic difference from the, to the air molecules. But then we realize, oh my God, we better pay attention to putting the thing in the world. So that's, we started that, and that from Darwin 4 on all the way now to Darwin 12, which I'll be happy to show you on your way out. 
we have devices which exist in the world. They look like robots, but they have simulated brains, but they don't have a Turing machine architecture because of the way they sample the world. And so uh, our hope is to do the following. Eventually, someday, we will be able to build a conscious artifact. Now imagine that. Isn't that a wild one? Because that says, I'm going to have a non-living thing that has primary consciousness. Well, you say, how the hell would you know? Well, I'll tell you what. Supposing it could do mental rotation. Supposing I showed some complex object, and then I rotated the object, okay? And it had to... I say, are these the same or not? And in its head, it had to go. Now, it can't do it with hands, right? Because they're mirror images. So I could use that as my control. If it does that, I'll give myself a high mark. I don't know that I'll get there before I go to signal to noise zero, but that's sort of the aim of brain-based devices. And there are groups of people thinking about it, but we're one group that really works from the bottom up. There are outfits that think they can go in the middle. We don't think that'll work. We think you really have... So one of our great problems is, can we have a million neurons? Our latest simulation offline, not on a brain-based device yet, has one million neurons and half a billion synapses, a computer program. It takes 60 times as long as real time to get that computation. So we've got to get more powerful computers. What's the limitation on building these different Darwin models? Because is it just a case of adding more neurons each time? Uh, we don't know. Uh, the problem is, is exactly one of those unconstrained problems. What's shocking to me is, for, oh, okay, I'll answer your question by telling you about a success. There's something called the hippocampus. That's a part of your brain near the skirt over here in the temporal lobe that is responsible for converting short-term memory to long-term memory. Okay? If you have epilepsy and they take both the hippocampi out, you have long-term memory up to that point, but you don't have any anymore. I say hello to you, you recognize me, you're conscious. You know, I go out of the room, you come back, you don't know who I am. All right? We have modeled the hippocampus in a brain-based device, and guess what? It works. And I can't understand it to this time, because it only involved a couple of hundred thousand neurons and less than a couple of million neuro, uh, synapses. The, the, the hippocampus has pretty simple circuitry. Well, simple, I wouldn't call it, okay. but it was circuitry that the scientists had worked out elsewhere, and we've done a little ourselves. And we showed that in silicon, and with these kinds of conceptions, and with these kinds of rules for synaptic change, we can actually put a thing in that behaves in a maze and finds there's something called the Morris Water Maze. Have you heard of that? Morris is, by the way, a member of NRP, the Neuroscience Research Program. Scottish. Yeah, Scottish. Yeah, Scottish. He, uh, we, we did a dry water maze. We didn't want to wet our BBD. So we put a black circle, which it couldn't distinguish from the black floor with its visual thing, but it could from an infrared signal. So it, we put things on the wall, and it would go hunting around, but it would have a value system, which is part of a BBD, and when it, by accident it found itself on top of this, it got a shot of value, and that strengthened its synapses. And pretty soon, by golly, it went straighter and straighter to the target, just like in a water maze, a rat in a water maze. Now, to go back to your question, we don't know, for instance, to have a conscious entity, how many neurons you really do have to have. Here, it was ridiculously smaller than the amount in a real hippocampus. It's a couple of hundred thousand. Something I still don't understand, except that maybe it has to do with the invariance of the structure. As long as the structure's there, you don't have to worry too much about the composition and the numbers. But we still don't know what the number is. So we're sort of going out and pushing as hard as we can and doing a little mysticism, putting up a magic horseshoe. And, you know. Anyhow, it is an exciting and, of course, overweening venture, isn't it? To say, well, someday they'll have a... But I don't have any doubt that there will be a conscious artifact, and I don't have any doubt that then somebody will be thinking, well, how can we make one that reports? Well, there will be two kinds of people, those who experience thrills and those who experience chills. Yeah. There will be people who are horrified. On the other hand, if you search in outer space uh, for intelligent life, this is the next thing out. I mean, wouldn't it be cool to have a phenotype? It won't be like us, so it's the same. We'll leave out sex, and it won't have a phenotype like ours. So you'll query it and see how it looks at the world. Wow. And amazing. 
there'll be a new kind of ethics for Ed Wilson to worry about, which is the ethics of killing a non-living creature. Hmm. Would you care to put a time scale on seeing the first conscious event in one of your own? Would you care to look at the IRS as an evaluation of my actuarial curve? <laughs> <laughs> I think they're going to give me three more years. <laughs> That's a question I choose not to answer <laughs> on the grounds of selfish self-preservation. Self mm -hmm. No, it probably will take a fair time. But imagine the arc, what I call the Galilean arc, from Galileo to that point. And that's what I call in that book, uh, Second Nature, the Galilean Ark. The Galilean Ark has, still has that to be answered. Unless you say, and I don't believe this extends my previous ideas, that you can't explain consciousness scientifically. Hmm. That's so, not true. I don't believe you can. I believe you can. But there still is a big dualist community out there. Who's oh boy, that. yes, because our language is dualistic, right? Uh, it's inherent. It's inherent. And we do treat each other as if we have free will. Certainly the judge does. You say, sorry, I killed my parents, but you should forgive me because I'm an orphan. No way. I mean, so this is a remarkable reach, isn't it? I mean, I admit that it may be a little early, but supposing you could actually achieve that. Well, I don't know. What would it mean? Well, it would mean you have perception Turing machines for sure, technically. But you'd also have a view of how knowledge is achieved, wouldn't you? Because, I mean, it was William James. He said the function of consciousness is knowing. So you could put a lot of philosophers to rest. In Boswell's Johnson, I think Johnson had a friend who said, I thought to go into philosophy, but cheerfulness kept breaking in. So <laughs> anyhow, there we are. On that note. It's been, yeah. a very, it's been a very enjoyable interview. Thank you so much. Thanks very much.